We're talking about the question, why are you alive? Why do you exist? What is the point of life? Why are you here? Why am I here? Why are we all here? The whole five billion of us. And what we have been doing is particularly concentrating on the explanation given by the most unusual individual that ever lived on our earth. And that is, of course, not Muhammad or Confucius or Zoroaster or the Hindu prophets, all of whom were just human beings like you and me, died and were buried, same as you and I will be. Uh, this man was entirely different from them. He, first of all, said that he was uniquely related to the maker behind the universe. And then he said that he lived a life that was absolutely pleasing to that creator. In other words, he lived a perfect life. And uh, unlike the characters that claim that kind of thing, he was not filled with egotism and filled with pride. And indeed, his enemies testified to the fact that he did live a perfect life and that they couldn't find any fault in him. But he also said that he was going to die like everybody else, but he had power over death and he could destroy death and could actually live uh, without the normal uh, visible means of support that we uh, think uh, are necessary for the support of natural life. And in fact, that's exactly what he did. He came back with open wounds in his hands that should have been streaming with blood and should have effectively prevented the blood circulation operating. And he came back uh, with the hole in his side that had been made by the sword, but he didn't seem to be prevented by these from staying alive and from eating uh, fish that was fried for him on the beach one morning. And in fact, he stayed alive for more than a month and was seen by above 500 people at one time. So obviously it was not hallucinations that uh, made them think they saw him. It was actually him alive. And then he lifted up off the earth and said that he would eventually come back in uh, some time later. And of course, that was the man Jesus of Nazareth. And he is the one that gives the best explanation of why we're here. And he pointed out that his father had put us here because he has a special purpose for you, for me. He has a special purpose for us. That's why we're all so different. Uh, there are things that you can do that only you can do. There's an attitude to life that you have and nobody else has. And this man, Jesus, explained that the reason for us all being so unique and different is that his father wants to show himself through us. And he can only do that if we begin to trust him and to ask him why we're here and what he wants us to do in helping him to complete the creation. And, uh, of course, he said if we will do that, he will give us all that we need in this present life. What we have been sharing the past few days is Jesus pointed out to us that, of course, we said, forget it. We're not going to trust some invisible creator for that kind of thing. We're going to make from this world what we need. And so that's what most of us have tried to do. We've tried to get what food, shelter, and clothing we need. We've tried to get what attention and what sense of significance and self-esteem and self-worth that we need. And we've ended up in tremendous frustration and futility because you can never get enough people to respect you. You can never get enough people to esteem you. You can never get enough people to pay attention to you and acknowledge you and recognize you to satisfy you in the sense that you have that you are infinitely valuable. And in fact, you are infinitely valuable. But of course, this man Jesus said that your value can only be uh, respected and acknowledged in a significant and worthy enough manner by the maker of the universe himself. And no other recognition or acknowledgement or acceptance will satisfy you. And of course, that's exactly what's happened. 
It doesn't matter how we strive to get the best degree we can. It doesn't matter how we strive to do the best job, be the best husband, be the best father. How even when we become famous, we can become the most famous singer, the most famous actor, the best sportsman. And yet somehow we never do feel that our value, our true worth is being recognized. And it's incredible how many famous people die in absolute futility over this very factor that we think they would major on. That is their self-worth and their self-esteem. And of course it's the same with the whole business of happiness because we decide, well, we're only here for a few years. We're not going to depend on some miserable creator to give us happiness. We're going to get happy ourselves. We're going to get all the happiness we can. And so we try to do that, and you know what we end up doing. It's amazing. But most of us end up trying to blot it all out. That's about the best happiness we can experience. That's pretty negative. Just blot out all the pain. And so most of us end up on some kind of drugs, whether it's heroin or whether it's crack or whether it's opium or, or whatever it is, or whether it's alcohol or whether it's popping pills. We end up trying to blot out the pain so that maybe just the absence of pain will at least be something. And so we end up in tremendous futility and frustration there too. Of course, what is the most tragic uh, factor in our lives is that after we sense that we are doing the wrong thing and we begin to try when we hear that there's a God or we hear that Jesus might have been really a real person, we begin rather late in life usually to try to live the way we're supposed to live. And that is where we meet our Waterloo. We find that we cannot live the way we were meant to live. We try to do what is right, but we can't do it. And we call out that classic old protest, the good that I would, I don't understand my own actions. I don't. Because the good that I would, I cannot do. And the evil that I hate, that's the very thing I do. And so we find that even when we're trying to do what is right and to live, maybe in some way trying to find the purpose that the Creator had in mind for us, or trying to trust Him, we find that we can't. And of course, the reason is that we have become perverted in our personalities. We've become totally perverted. Instead of living from the inside out, that is from his ideas for us and from our trust in him and from listening to him, we have started to live from the outside in. That is from what people think of us. We've tried to live dependent on things for our security. We've tried to live dependent on circumstances for our happiness. So when we try to live the way we were supposed to, we find it's impossible because our whole personality has become the opposite of what it was meant to be. And we enter into that dreadful Jekyll and Hyde syndrome, you remember. That was the novel that Robert Louis Stevenson wrote whereby uh, Dr. Jekyll, who was respectable and loved to help the poor, found developing within himself a Mr. Hyde that roamed the streets at night and did all kinds of dreadful, violent and immoral deeds. And eventually that Mr. Hyde took over from him, you remember. He invented a drug that could turn him into the Mr. Hyde when he wanted, and gradually the Mr. Hyde took over his whole life, and he could not control it any longer. That's what happens with most of us. Even when we're trying to be good, even when we're trying to be right, even when we're trying to be the kind of people that we think we should be, we find there is another ego inside us that seems to take us over and prevent us doing what we want to do. So many of us go home at night determined to be really happy, determined to be really kind to our wives and good and patient with our children. And before the night is out, we have blown it. And we've just lost our temper and we've been cruel to everybody and we've made a mess of the whole thing. It's the same in regard to jobs. Many of us decide, I'm going to stay at this job, I'm going to be consistent, I'm going to be persistent, I'm going to be routine, I'm going to be faithful and loyal. And whether we like it or not, we end up blowing the whole thing into the air. We don't know why. So many of us have had that problem of this Jekyll and Hyde 
relationship inside our own lives, this schizophrenia. And of course, we talked about how the death of Jesus, in fact, is the only thing that will deal with that Jekyll and Hyde syndrome. It's the only thing that will deal with it. There's nothing else. Because even Robert Louis Stevenson, his novel, you remember, said that one of them had to die. Let's talk a little about that tomorrow.